What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Top Rank Unboxed. It's your boy, Ricky. And I'm joined here by my co-host, Jalen. And we are here in Vegas because we have a very special guest with us right now. We're super excited today to talk to Michaela Mayer. Michaela is a former world champ, and she's currently preparing for her upcoming fight in London on April 15th. Thanks. I hate that new title, former. I don't like that. I at felt all. really bad yeah, saying we, that, but I, I was like, I'm say it. I don't want to <laughs> say it. I don't want to say it, but we're not going to act like you are. Like, you know, you did you did your thing at 130. You can't act like that wasn't uh, wasn't done. Thank you. And it's you, the name you. of the game, you know? Like, yeah. it really be like that sometimes. Yeah, it it really happens. I'll get them back. But, yeah. How are you feeling about that, by the way? What are the um, sentiments? Well, it's been a while now. Yeah. Obviously, like, I went through it. You know, it, I think that. <sighs> It took so much for me to get to that level, you know, and a perfect example is like when I first won my first world title against Brodnika, my life didn't change very much. Nothing, you know, the attention really wasn't yet on women's boxing. I go in with my second title against Hamadouche and, you know, a little bit more attention, but still like not life changing. Whereas like maybe the men, things would really just switch over overnight or where women's boxing is now, you know, being a champion like me will change your life. And so, um, it was just frustrating to finally get to that that point in my career that I knew I'd, I'd always get to and that I worked so hard to be at and then let it slip through my fingers and not and not be able to kind of take that next step in my career, have to take another step back. So um, that's okay. You know, I'm no stranger to perseverance. I've been through this before and that's boxing and just got to keep going and yeah. get back on top. Yeah. And it's crazy because you were the first – woman signed to top rank she was first you were first uh coming straight out of the olympics or yeah coming straight out of the top olympics rank. yeah yeah i know top rank had a couple girls or women back in the day um mia st john mm -hmm. Uh, did Lucia Riker do, do Lucia a fight? Lucia Riker did a couple of fights yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and then there was just a huge chunk of time like a whole decade where women's boxing sort of just you know didn't yeah. the momentum didn't didn't keep going and so uh yeah after that big gap of time off for women there I came. I remember sitting in that office right there. Yeah. Wow. I walked by, I'm like, mm, that's the yeah. office I got myself signed in because wow. that's really what I felt like. I felt like when I was coming to meet with Todd DeBuff here um, and I sat in that room, I was like, okay, Michaela, you got to sell yourself. Sell yourself. You have to because it was a risk for them to take on a female. There was no market for women's boxing yet. And I had to convince him that I would be the one to change that. Wow. So getting off of that, right, you... Did you feel any pressure on yourself, like being the only woman signed to top rank at that time? Yeah, I mean, there's always pressure, but I I thrive under pressure. Like I asked for this type of pressure, you know? Um, I was fine with it and I knew that I had a lot to take on because maybe there weren't a lot of women who had my platform and and had the 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 promoter and the network behind them. And so there was there was pressure on me to show that we belonged. And it took five years then to sign another female. But like to me, you know, this is top rank on ESPN. This is the greatest promoter in the world. And so it's not it's not as easy. I feel like them picking up Sinisa Estrada, it was kind of like, okay, Michaela, you, you did a little bit of, of your part to show that there is a market for women's boxing and that we do belong in this sport. And so um, it seems like maybe only two female to only two females with, with top rank is not a lot, but I know where it started. And so I think it's it's a good progression and hopefully they sign more from here on out. How excited were you when they signed Sinisa? I love Sinisa. I've known Sinisa of Sinisa for years, obviously, like yeah. just whatever through social media, but we actually never met until the Taylor Serrano fight. Oh, shit. And that's the first time really? we met. She's like, are you going? I'm like, yeah, I'm going. She's like, I'm going too. I don't want to go by myself. I'm like, dude, meet up with me and Ginny. We'll go together. And um, she like right off the bat, like instant, instant best friend vibes. Yeah, you guys are, are super besties. I remember we was in New York last month and you, you guys were together just, uh, you know, killing shit. Yeah. Cool to see. And good thing, because that would be pretty shitty if like they signed someone I absolutely but you didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I would not be. Fine. I mean, like when you first started hearing the rumblings, though, that like she like she might be coming to top rank. Like what? How were you feeling at that time? Well, she was sort of in that process when we met up at the Taylor Serrano fight. And I don't know, I think it's really important for women to talk about finances and talk about, um, you know, what we're getting for fights and not with everybody, obviously, but I, I, I knew that she was in a position where she was 
trying to make change and go in a mm-hmm. different direction. I heard rumors. And so I basically just like flat out, we, we, we discussed money. We talked about where women's boxing is and what we're getting and what we feel like we deserve and, and all that. And so that sort of really, what she said is that sort of helped to make her decision because she had to put her foot down against, mm-hmm. you know, the promoter and the mm-hmm. situation that she was in and demand what she felt she was worth. Have you always been business minded? I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I always have. I, I remember thinking back in the day when I, started on this journey and insanely told myself that I want to be the best female fighter in the world when we were, there was no Olympics for us. No promoters were signing women. Um, I, but I knew I had to, if I wanted to make it in the sport, I really had to go out of my way and promote myself. And when I was, how old was I, how old was I like when I met George, like 10 years ago, I just walked my ass into like all these agencies in Hollywood trying to find a, a manager. Cause I'm like, if I'm going to make it in the sport, I need management, I need representation, I need sponsors. I got to do it. And so, yeah, I just sort of always had that. Speaking of Hollywood and managers, um, you had a career before boxing. You were like a rock star. Oh God, I wouldn't Let's call it get a into career. it. Let's <laughs> get into it. Yeah, we got to get into that. Oh, I want to know. God. When did you start playing the, the bass, right? When yeah. did that start? I was like 11 years old with my best friend, Allie, and we were in middle school. And we were like super into Black Sabbath, um, you know, wow. Led Zeppelin, yeah. all these uh, Slipknot. I mean, all these bands that her dad was really into and he kind of got us into it. And we decided that we wanted to start a band. So she played guitar. I picked up the bass. And that was like my little thing as a teenager. I was a little metalhead. I had like all black hair. I, I saw the photos. I saw the <laughs> I photos. Saw the <laughs> like my nose oh. was pierced. My tongue was pierced. I had like all these piercings here. It was called Leah Fail. Um, my singer, she's the one, my old singer, Nita Strauss. Yep. She's the one who walked me out for the Hamadouche fight. Yes. And mm-hmm. she, I always knew she'd be the one to really make it in music because she's just so talented. But she's the lead guitarist now for Alice Cooper and... And a ton of other projects, yeah. and she's just so badass. Yeah, she's you know she's one of the she's regarded as one of the greatest guitarists in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think she's with Demi Lovato now. Demi Lovato, yeah. She and is. you know it was great to see that she was able to walk you off for your fight. How surreal was that for you when you know you you guys made that work? Like, yo, I'm about to unify, and then I got my girl here, who's the greatest guitarist in the world. Tell <laughs> us about that feeling when you. Made well, that I'd been happen. planning it. I've been planning that for a long time, but I wanted to make sure it was the right fight. You know, because I never actually had a, a walkout performance before that. My other world title and like the last two years before that it was in the bubble. Everything was like in the pandemic. And so when my it's kind of it's kind of crazy how like the rise of my career and like the the bulk of my career, my, you know, my first world title fights was during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. kind of sucks. Yeah, but I mean, insane. I think I was one of the luckier fighters. I did get to fight at least. And, you know, top rank kept me somewhat busy. And um, but yeah, it was my first like performance walkout. So I knew mm-hmm. I was going to do it, but. I think it worked out perfectly. Hamadouche going for the unifying the world titles. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. We'll do it again. For sure. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you want to do more like performances like that? Yeah, I liked it. You know, when I when I fought in London, I came out to the Spice Girls and I had yeah. some dancers out there. And that, I mean, my from metal to Spice Girls, like that's just me. You know, yeah. I, I'm never going to like follow the crowd in a sense where I feel like I have to walk out every time to this like hard ass hip hop song. Yeah. <laughs> and I have before. If that's when I'm feeling that fight. Right. Um, I sort of developed that in my training camps, mm. you know, and I sort of whatever I'm feeling, where I'm at in that in my time in that light or that my time in life, you know, wherever I am mentally. Um, I was in London. Obviously, the Spice Girls were a huge influence on me growing up. I loved them. My first concert ever. So I just felt like I had to do it. How how crazy was it when uh, one, one of them reached out to you and wished you uh, good luck on the fight? Yeah, that was super cool, Sporty Spice. Yeah. I've been uh, channeling a lot of Sporty Spice. I really like the Spice Girls. It's not really about... It's about fashion sense, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, I am always yeah. feel like I'm dressed like some type of Spice Girl. And I can tell you what it is. Like, obviously, I'm sporty today, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, they were cool. I wish they would have came to the fight, but <laughs> a little shade. You, you have <laughs> sporty spies. Where are you at? You got to slide in their DMs. I did. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, oh shit, shit, that's sad. Okay, no, I messaged sporty spies oh. because I wanted her to like, because she's a DJ now, and so I was like, oh, maybe she'll like DJ, 
me out. Oh, wow. You know, but oh, she had cool. actually had a show that night. So. Oh, figures. They're always oh but she responded. Her. So she no, responded. She didn't okay, respond. okay, never mind. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. I'm pouring salt in the wounds. I'm but so then she sorry. sent me the video. So I was like, okay, she's forced. She probably gets a lot of DMs. Oh, man. Maybe she didn't even look at the request. Yeah, she probably didn't think of that. That's what I tell myself. Probably. Oh, man. They didn't see the request. They didn't see the request. I wanted to ask you the comparisons of like life on the road. You know, I know you guys weren't making much money and it was hard out there when you guys were touring. Compare that to like that as an amateur when you're constantly on the road, you're not really making money and you got to put all your money into these term tournaments and travel. Mm -hmm. How would you compare the similarities and differences in that regard? Um, yeah, I mean, I think me, my, my career as an amateur was on such a higher level, you know, but, uh, I did do a couple tours in the, in the back of our drummers, Toyota Tacoma, and we just drove on for days on end from show to show. But I think like the biggest comparison is just having a passion. You know, at that stage, the money doesn't matter so much. Like you, you hope to get to that level and you, you believe you will, but it's like, you're so passionate about the sport or whatever you're doing. And I feel like that's always been my message to people um, and to young people. It's like when we're younger, we do all these we have all these different hobbies. We have all these different interests. And something happens as we get older that society tells us, oh, no, that's not a, that's not going to be a real job. That's just a passion. That's just a hobby. Like you need to go to school. You need to do this and you need to pay your bills and create stability for yourself. And like I just think that is so wrong because there's so many talents and interests that we have as a young person and you need to pay attention to those. you got to pay attention to those interests. Um because that's that's what you're really meant to do. I really believe that, and so I feel like that's something that I've always done. No matter what I've, no matter what it was, whether it was in, being in band or boxing, but I've just always been an extremist. And so mm -hmm. when I get into something, it's like I give it my all, hundred percent. Did your parents kind of inspire you to think like that? Because I know the school system doesn't inspire us to think like yeah. that. Yeah, no, they don't. So, so I come that? from a really untraditional family. Like I would say that, yeah, my my indirectly my my dad for sure was definitely um a big reason as to why i was able to dream so big and i just didn't have fear he never instilled fear in me my parents mm -hmm. aren't like they didn't they didn't go to college they don't have like these traditional uh life the careers or life like so they never really push that on us um but my dad just always let us be who we were you know like i i didn't have like the standard to live up to. And he just never, like, the best way I can put it is he's never instilled fear in us. And so when I was, when I found boxing and I fell in love with it, I just immediately believed that I could make it a reality. Wow. Yeah. And my dad supported all the, me along the whole way. Yeah. Your, your pops used to, I was reading up on it. Your pops was like your guys' biggest supporter when you guys were touring when you were in the band. My dad went on our first tour with us all around the U.S. He drove. He knew I was 12 years old, so you know, 13 or something. So he didn't want me to go alone. And then one day we all woke up in a hotel room and we're, we're like, where's your dad? I'm like, I don't know. Where's he going? He probably went to get coffee or something. He comes back with coffee in his hand, but also a Leah Phil <laughs> tattoo. Oh, my A gosh. tattoo on his back yeah. shoulder. Oh my we're God. like, yeah, your dad, you're so cool. It was badass, wow. but yeah. Wait, are you are you close with your sisters? <laughs> yeah, no, I have uh, two sisters. Yeah, one younger, one older, and the middle child. And yeah, we're all super close. And I think that's you know that says a lot just because of what we went we went through so much. And I I've, I've seen a lot of siblings just sort of drift apart. Yeah. Um, with life in general, you know, maybe they had a great upbringing, but a lot of people just drift apart. And we really stayed close, so. I'm proud of that for sure. Did you guys fight when you were younger? Like, Hell did you yeah. hate each other? I, I like hated my boring. sister when we yeah. were little, and now she's like, I can't live without her. But yeah. We fought. Like, we physically fought. Oh, yeah. And I've That's never, everybody. but like, I'm not that type of person. Like, I don't, <laughs> I really don't. Like, y'all was like, throwing not, hands here? Yes. Like, I have a scar on my arm from oh, her. Like, it was bad. Uh, yeah. And I'm I not like that. that. She hated me. My sisters hated me for a while. I was a bully. <laughs> oh, you were the bully you were too, really? bully. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just always so much stronger than them. Like, I could always just pin them down, like, at the the same time and just mess with them and run and laugh and oh yeah i was mean did they do sports too like uh no okay so there's no competition i come in from that. like a super hippie family mm. yeah like my dad lives in a van and like travels around the u.s doing like jobs all different types of jobs um my older sister they're all hippies like they <laughs> don't wear makeup they don't wear bras they just run around <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really live in life oh my gosh <laughs> 
<laughs> so you would con- so you would consider yourself a hippie as well? I mean, definitely my my family upbringing. Yeah, everyone yeah. just super. And I think that that has a lot to do with how I was raised in that mindset too. You know, just of not having fear. Yeah, that not makes so fear much sense. And just yeah, no, yeah. not a lot of rules. Mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely put my dad through hell. I probably should have had a little bit more rules. Like I look back now, I'm like, how did he allow <laughs> me to do all that? But. Uh, you know, I also grew up really fast. And so I was able to sort of, I always thought I started boxing late, which I technically did compared to like men, but I was 17 and in hindsight, like I found my thing young, you know, I was really able to like zone in and, yeah. and, and, you know, work and get it and be good. Now I have a career and I look back at a lot of you know, maybe friends I came up with and they still don't really know which direction they're going in. So I'm grateful that I found boxing at 17. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, huge. But what was going to be the thing, like, if you didn't find boxing, what would happen if you didn't find it? Something. I know something because I just had an epiphany when I was in my senior year. And I was like, I don't want, I was in my fourth high school. I was just kind of like, barely went to school. I don't even know how I passed. I've always been really smart, actually. I realized like when I, it was about like my senior year that I wanted to be good at something. I just wanted to be good at something. And so it just started with trying something new and my dad always had me in sports growing up like soccer and stuff and i never played any high school sports and then i was like get your ass back in a sport and there was a muay thai kickboxing gym down the street from my house that i always walked past and so it just started with walking in and wow signing myself up yeah so started you, with muay thai muay thai first huh so you was yeah. throwing them elbows and legs first yeah you started throwing them hands exclusively this, wow. this is like gina carano days like so oh. gina carano oh, was I like remember yeah. those remember her? Yeah. So yeah she was like the girl i was like yeah, yeah i want to fight gina carano one day um but yeah but if it wasn't for if it wasn't for Muay Thai or boxing like I don't I don't know but I know that I had the mindset to want to be good at something so I would have done something extreme yeah you wouldn't just be sitting on your ass like you would have done something I could tell by your character like you would have had a career like if I had to go back to school today I never would like I'm not I whatever I don't (laughs) want to do that but I would be a veterinarian. Oh my god! Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you love animals. You love animals. So yeah, yeah. I think I'd be a veterinarian, and then just have like a big farm with horses. And then, like, my horse got sick, I could just. Well, we gotta, we gotta, heal it. we gotta link you up with uh, Valdez. Valdez got a whole ranch. I know. Where he's, uh, he's got like with the gators and yeah, shit. Yeah, he has everything. everything. I, know. I don't know about the gators, but no, a little too extreme. I love them from afar. But yeah, my dogs are always with me. I drove here with them. Oh, three dogs. What my- kind of dogs? They're all um they're all adopted from the shelter, so they're all mutts in some way. But one's like a shepherd mix, one's a um, boxer mix. I don't know, but I every time I go through it mentally, like I end up going to the pound and getting another dog. So it's actually oh really dangerous. God. I really need a farm because I'm gonna have like a hundred dogs by the time. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> need, you need like a whole separate house for that. Yeah, no. but that's, that's why I have I got cool, my though. third dog after this last fight. I was like. Ah. <laughs> ass to the pound. Yeah. I was like, give me your oldest dog. I'm going to give it the best last few Aww. years of its life. The fact yeah. that you're willingly getting dogs that are toward the end of their life. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's really good. That's crazy. I would be a wreck. I'm too emotionally unstable for that. Yeah. That's so sad. Have you had like any deaths in your animal? No, experience? not in my animal. I'm just like good with death, I think. Oh. Yeah. I never cry when people die. Really? You know, you know when I'm going to cry though? When Coach Al dies. Oh. Because he's Yikes. the oldest person in my life right now. Like, my grandparents have passed. Like, I don't really have a huge family. And Coach Al is definitely, like, the oldest person, closest person to me ever yeah. at that age. Oh, so no. I'll be a wreck when he goes. But we always talk about death. Like, yeah. I feel like talking about death helps a lot. Um like Coach Al's always like, ah, I'm working on my will today, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I hope I live one more year. I'm like, Coach Al, shut up. Please don't <laughs> talk like that. Yeah. But we do. We just like we talk about it and it's like, I don't know. We know it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah. So with your view on death, so are you one of those type of fighters? Are you going there like, I will fight to the fucking death? Like, my, now I am. With my eyes hanging out, I'm still <laughs> At this point, at this point, I'm definitely, I definitely have a chip on my shoulder. Like yeah. this point, I'm like, well, then Artitude, you're going to have to kill me mm-hmm. because- I never want to feel that way again. And I, I, it was like a little reminder. I feel like it was just a little reminder of you never let your foot off the gas and you fight till the end, no matter what, because you just never know. You never know what the judges were thinking. And I, I've said this, that I, in my mind, I had a strategy that I thought was working in that fight. If I would have known the judges were seeing it a different way, I would have kicked it into another gear because I know I have that in me. And so I just got to remember that feeling and, 
you never know what the judges are thinking and you just gotta let it all leave it all in line yeah leave yeah. it all in there talk talk about some of the mental work you had to do you know handling the first loss like <clears throat> um so it just hits you the second you wake up your just heart just drops to your toes and it's like where the in between time of training camp when you're when you're coming off a win is a lot easier but that in between time which it also can get weird it's i think any fighter when they're not in camp it, they go through it like we need that structure we need that camp life i always feel better when i'm in camp but when you're in that that middle area and you're coming off a loss it's definitely hard on the psyche and i felt it every morning i woke up and i just sort of had to surround myself with like people that reminded me of my purpose because I felt like what was my purpose at the time now you know mm -hmm. um it just sucked it was hard to stay motivated but in it was hard to stay motivated like on a daily basis but I kept telling my manager and, and top rank I was like get me if I ASAP get me if I ASAP like I was motivated to get back in camp and redeem myself because I still feel like I'm the best like I still feel like I'm the greatest and that's really what I want to show this year is that I'm still the best and um, I think a fighter like Christina Leonardo too is going to bring that out of me. She has a style that's going to force me to use a little bit of everything, all my tools. And yeah, now I just have to like walk the walk. And I've always said that one loss shouldn't define your career. It shouldn't. It's got to change in boxing as long as you're putting on good fights and um, giving people the matchups that they want to see, which is what I have done. I always want to do, continue to do. So I just got to walk the walk now. I got to. Got to back up my words and yeah. just go in there and do it. So without looking too far ahead, we're going to talk about your favorite person, Alicia Baumgartner. We all saw the fight. It was stupid close. It was dumb close. It was very, anybody who says it was a wash, like, oh, for either person is, is full of shit. It was close. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on hopefully getting a rematch someday? I've made it clear that I want the rematch. You know, I made it very clear. I took a few months to really, really push for that rematch and, um, it's not just me. I know the fans want to see it. And that's motivation for me, too, because I've always been about the fans. I want to put on big fights. I never, ever want to be a boring fighter. I never want to be the type of fighter, you know, dodging big fights because you're scared to lose or scared of, to lose your money or their belts or whatever. Like, I never want to be that way. I'm an entertainer first. So I want to put on the fights that the fans want to see because they're the biggest asset, right? They they provide a platform and a career for me. Like, got to give back to the fans. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, she... She hasn't really wanted said anything about wanting to rematch herself. So I understand that she wanted to go undisputed. She did that. And now we'll see what she does. Uh, at this point, I, like I said, I've made it clear what I wanted, but I can't sit here and dwell and, and continue to just like bitch and complain and, and, and speak out about it. I said what I said, and now I have to focus on my next task and i've moved up to 135 i'm really excited about being at 135 i feel like it's past due should have done it a few years ago but i had a goal that i was trying to to fulfill um and so yeah i'm here if, if she when she when she comes knocking because i know they will they'll come knocking um it'd be stupid not to the the fans want to see it and the eyes are there like the money's there for it so, oh hell yeah the yeah. for that first fight you guys sold the fuck out sold of that fight it that was fight. crazy i've never seen like i've covered a lot of your fights i've never seen like you guys mm -hmm. bring that type of energy and even she in her previous fights didn't have that type of energy no and it's the rivalry you know and i yeah. i have to have some respect for her as my rival because that is we we need each other for this fight. Like we needed each other for this rivalry. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as we don't like each other, like we both bring value. And again, back to the business mindset, which I'm sure she's gonna have to learn about. She's gonna have to get one because she'd be stupid to not capitalize on this. It's still something that people want to see, and it's a rivalry that's still very much alive. So I know they'll come knocking, but until then, I'm gonna go. I'm gunning for the 135 pound champion. That's it. Whatever division I go to, which is going to be multiple, I have the height mm -hmm. and reach and skill to go to multiple divisions. But whoever, whatever division I'm in, I'm going for the champion. That's my mindset. So I'm going for Katie Taylor. I'm going to do whatever I can to get that fight with her, mm -hmm. become mandatory, and continue to challenge myself against, you know, top contenders like Leonardo Tu and beat them and get my shot at the titles again. You're fighting Christina uh, Leonardo Tu uh, at Copper Box Arena uh, in London. So describe that feeling of like, 
fighting over there. You know, you went there the first time last time and like talk to us about the atmosphere compared to that of a U.S. audience. Um, well, first off, you have to understand that the U.K. is a lot smaller. And here in America, the competition for the media's attention is just insane, especially when you have the NFL and the NBA and all these other sports on ESPN and whatever. So in the UK, it's like you have soccer and you have boxing. Like those are their top two sports. And so for me, the business mindset in me, the businesswoman in me is like, wh you, why not go capitalize on that market? When they, when they love boxing, they're really, really loving women's boxing and supporting that. And so um, during the last fight, we went out there twice because the queen had passed. And so those two times out there, I went out two weeks early each time and I did a ton of media. Like I really, really sold the hell out of that fight. I did everything I possibly could. And I learned a lot in the process. And I feel like this is me just capitalizing on that momentum that I already built. And the fans really embraced me there. And so I'm gonna go back and give them another great performance. and hopefully steal some of Joe Joyce's fans yeah. while I'm at it. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they love you out there. Uh, the, the atmosphere is just different. You know, I was with you guys in London both times and it's just like, holy fuck. Like you, yeah. they, people really come out and support, you know? I just felt like it was the right move. I also, I did have the option to fight on a card here in the US and it was the co-main for Robisi Ramirez and Dog Bay, which I thought was an awesome fight and I love them both. But I just felt like, Again, the business woman in me is like, okay, you can be here on ESPN Plus or you can be on ESPN Plus and BT Sports in London and sort of keep that momentum going from your last fight. And yeah, so I, I chose Comey for Joe Joyce. She fought everybody, right? She fought Katie. She fought she fought Alicia too, right? No. Yeah, she fought Alicia. She mm -hmm. lost Alicia. So mm -hmm. that's my kind of way of like trolling a little bit because <laughs> this is entertainment at the end of the day, right? And I feel like me fighting Leonardo too, which is the girl that beat Baumgartner, the only girl to beat her. Um, is a way for the fans to sort of follow the story, continue to follow the story, continue to stay excited about a potential rematch in the future, um, and just excited about women's boxing because I feel like we're doing cool shit like mm -hmm. that, and it's just fun. So, yeah, yeah, it is the perfect storm too, though, with the buildup between you and Alicia because it's it, you guys were each other's perfect dance partners for yeah. that, you know, and like the sport needs that, mm -hmm. especially women's boxing right now. So yeah. I mean, just the sport in general. Oh, yeah, like, yeah know, just the not, sport. We don't, we don't get enough of the big fights all the time. So to yeah. see you, you girls really doing that more consistently, like Amanda is going to fight uh, Katie again, hopefully, you know, assuming she yeah. recovers from injury, but some big ass fights out there, man. You know, and you weren't, mm -hmm. people weren't thinking about that a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. They really weren't. Yeah. And now it's like it's on a big platform. It's 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 on ESPN. It's everywhere. And so. the women are going where they need to go to make those fights happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm no different. You know, uh, I want to challenge myself at 142. Chantel Cameron, she, you know, she made it clear she'd be happy to fight me. So uh, props to her for, you know, wanting to, to take on challenges, too. Women are just going to multiple different divisions and and trying to make the biggest fights possible because we know that that's the only way that we're going to get the respect that we deserve. Yeah. yeah. What's sure. the max that you'll go up to, you think? I just don't see myself saying at 135 long. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a natural 140 pounder. And so in a few years, being able to continue to build the muscle and not train on such a calorie deficit, which I was to make 130 and just like really settling into my body and letting my muscles grow, I could easily fight at 147. And if the opportunity arises and I want to sort of uh, – reignite that rematch with terry harper mm. and she's at 154 mm. right now you got tasha jonas these are these are all potential fights for me because they're all big names we've all worked hard to build our brand and get our name out there and so um i'm gonna go where i'm wanted i'm gonna go where the fans want me you're chill look at that oh you're killing shit look at that <laughs> wait so when you're training in a calorie deficit um, do you feel like death? Like do you die? Because that sounds horrible. Yeah, it's really camps are hard, you know. Um when I was fighting at 130, you know, I work with perfecting athletes and they're geniuses when it comes to 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 weight cut and weight weight athletes, you know, in weight sports. Um so I did it smart, but yeah, you're constantly training on a calorie deficit. You have to, and I wasn't really horrible. able to put on the muscle. And I know I'm a strong fighter. I mean, I know I, I have power and I Feel like i've had to sacrifice that a little bit in order to, to make the way stay at 130 yeah. and fulfill my goals so i'm really excited about just 
you know, seeing how my body performs at a more natural weight and uh, hopefully get those get those those knockdowns and those knockouts back on my record because I know I know I got it. I just uh, feel like this will be a more comfortable weight and hopefully you'll see it. Yeah. yeah. So with all the, with all the chaos and uh, training camp and fighting all the time, you know, how do you treat your downtime? Like, what do you do to kind of keep your peace when you're not in fighting? camp? Uh, both in camp and in out camp. There is no downtime in camp. Mm -hmm. God, it's just, it's constant, you know, um, two, three workouts a day. I go to bed at, I'm in bed at 830 every night. People think I'm crazy. <laughs> Coach I go to bed at 930, I so I, I, I get you. And I'm not even in a camp, but I yeah. go to sleep at 930 every I, night. No, so I Coach K it. is like, he's got all these young guys who want to like do their last workout of the day at like 730 p.m. And I'm like, absolutely not. I am I'm literally <laughs> like, I've already eaten dinner. I'm like showered. I'm like chilling, ready to go to bed because I want to sleep 10 hours a night. I don't really nap same, during the day. You know, same. I'm not like 22 anymore. So like, I just don't sleep during the day, mm -hmm. but I get up early and I'm most productive early in the mornings. And then I want to sleep 10 hours a night. Like you should as an athlete when you're training three times yeah. a day, yeah. I've got to sleep. And so that's my schedule and that's what I do. Nice. That makes me happy to hear that you prioritize your, your sleep. That's good. Yeah. That's really good. So you prioritize so sleep in camp. So then what's what's the thing out of camp? Like what, what's, your, um, what's your downtime look like? Gosh, my out of camp, it's it's just as crazy and busy to mm. me because like I put, put everything on the back burner when I'm in camp. Um, and it's not always by choice. It's because coach Al is so on my ass that like, I'm not allowed to do anything during the day. I'm not allowed to run errands. Mm. Like I have to be trained and be in bed. And he, he's just really strict with me and he's there the whole time. Either I'm living with him or he's living with me at my house. And so I feel like a lot of fighters don't do that. They don't have their coach breathing over them 24 seven, even in the house. So, um, yeah, when I'm not in camp, it's like I'm making up for all that. Like my, you know, my sisters or my friends or, you know, doing the commentating gigs that I'm doing now, which is super fun and I'm really enjoying and um, maybe going to a couple of fights that I'm that I'm fans of, other fighters that I'm fans mm -hmm. of and just, God, living life. I don't know. And then all of a sudden I'm like, got to get back in camp, got to mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. Do you think after fighting you'll do commentating full time? Yeah, I think that I will definitely continue the commentating. It's fun for me. It's a way for me to be a part of boxing, you know, on the other side of the ropes. Yeah. Um, I also learn a lot while I'm doing that as a fighter. It's just like a different perspective, just breaking down the opponents and studying and analyzing. Um, so that's fun for me. But yeah, who knows what I'll do? Uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. Life changes, you know. I'm definitely going to have a farm. Yes. So that's going to take a lot of my time. Oh, you're going to love yeah. that. I can see you thriving with a farm. Yeah. That's oh, going to be great. Lord. That'll be fun. No, we'll see. I don't so know. Fun. I'm really, uh, like I said, I'm an extremist. So right now I still have just re-signed with the top rank for three more years. Yeah. Um, will I fight after three years? We'll see. I don't know. I, but I'm still fully invested in my career. I feel like that's another thing about losing the belts is most people lose the belts maybe like on their decline or when they're on their way out. Like I'm like in my, I feel like I'm still haven't even hit my peak yet. Like I feel like I'm still getting so much better. And I feel like a lot of the women, we do peak kind of a little bit later in life. Maybe we didn't have the opportunities younger. So we don't have as many miles on us. Cause I didn't start till yeah. I was 17, yeah. but I don't know. I feel great. And I just want to, I still have so much to accomplish, so yeah. I don't even know. I can't even think about. Yeah, I mean, there's no need to think about that yeah. yet. But yeah. other than the farm, <laughs> you're gonna have a farm for yeah, sure. I gotta think about that because yeah. I gotta it's, start planning. You know, we're gonna wrap up. We really appreciate you coming out here, talking to us. You know, we know you gotta Thanks. get back to the grind. Um, you got any final message to the fans? <sighs> Just tune in April fifteenth. Um, it's not a comeback fight. I didn't go anywhere. I'm still, I'm still the best. I'm still great. I'm still getting better every day. And so I'm going to continue to put on exciting performances for you guys. So tune in April 15th, Mayor Leonardo to ESPN plus.